We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, but before I introduce our presenter for today, let me first introduce myself. My name is Pat Rutledge, and I'm the executive director of the Marco Island Historical Society here on, on beautiful Marco Island. This is actually the ninth of our Zoom in uh, programs. We began this series in September or August, actually, I think it was August of last year when um, the pandemic shut down our regular programming. So we've been working awfully hard to make certain that we stay connected with our members, our supporters, um, those that care a great deal about the history of Marco Island. So this is one of the ways that we're able to do that. This, this afternoon, we've got a very special presentation for you. Uh, and I will in a minute introduce our curator and presenter, Austin Bell. But I did also want to take a moment to say that, you know, this has been a very difficult year for historical societies and history museums in general. Literally one third of the museums and historical societies as a result of the pandemic have closed their doors or are closing their doors never to reopen. Um, and the Marco Island Historical Society is trying very hard not to be one of those. So if you enjoy our programming, if you appreciate our history, if you um, like very much coming to our award-winning museum, please think about donating to us. Think about helping us to go on. It's very easy to do. Just go to our website, the mihs.org and click to donate and anything that you can do for us would really be for Marco Island's history and our mission to preserve and share it so in advance I thank you for considering that now let me introduce um, our speaker Mr. Austin J. Bell I'm going to read a little bit about Austin it was uh, part of the flyer that we uh, released, letting you know that this program is happening. And then I'll add just a comment or two. So Mr. Bell is the curator of collections for the Marco Island Historical Society, and also a consulting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. He serves on the Collier County Historic Archaeological Preservation Board, and in 2018 was named Marco Island's Citizen of the Year by the Naples Daily News. He's the author of three books, including one that you'll hear more about today, The Nine Lives of Florida's Famous Key Marco Cat. Let me also say that today happens to be National uh, Employee Appreciation Day. And Austin was the first employee that the Marco Island Historical Society hired. And so it's rather fitting that we um, are appreciating him today. And he's going to be the one that's going to be telling us more about our, our famous and iconic Key Marco cat. So with that, let me introduce to you Mr. Austin Bell. Okay, well, thank you so much, Pat. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here with you today to talk about uh, something that is near and dear to my heart, and that is Marco Island's history, in particular, um, the world famous Key Marco Cat artifact. And so uh, specifically, uh, I'm gonna be talking to you about the life of the cat during the past 125 years, uh, from the moment it was uncovered from a muck pit on Marco Island in 1896 to its present location on exhibit at the Marco Island Historical Museum. Uh, and you might think, well, gee, being a museum object for 125 years wouldn't be that interesting. But as you'll see today, at least in the case of the cat, it actually can be fraught with drama and intrigue. And uh, it's no coincidence, in fact, that today, March 5th, is the 125th anniversary of its discovery. And along with that, we're pleased to announce that the cat, which was originally scheduled to return to the Smithsonian Institution this April, after our initial loan, um, is now going to be with us for a further five years until April 2026. So if you haven't seen the cat on display yet, you'll now have more of an opportunity, especially as things begin to open up uh, after uh, in life after COVID. Uh, and not only that, we also have a new book coming out, as Pat mentioned, in September through the University Press of Florida uh, that talks explicitly about the cat and all of its nine lives. And some of that uh, is what I'm going to share with you today. It comes from a couple chapters in this new book. 
Um, but I first wanted to start off uh, with a poll question. And um, I wanted to ask you first of all, uh, has anyone actually seen the Key Marco Cat in person? It's a simple yes, no uh, question and I'll open it up for voting. Uh, just take a few seconds to tell us whether or not you've seen the cat. And here comes, oh, quite a few have seen the cat actually. Already we're at 82%. Wow. Okay, that's terrific. We've got almost all of the votes in. 48 of 52 and 73% of you, three quarters have seen the cat in person. That is awesome. Um, it's really a unique experience. I go over and check on the cat every other day. I got to go wish it a happy birthday today after this talk. But um, for those of you, the 27% that haven't seen it in person, I hope uh, during this next five years, if you get the chance to come down to Marco Island and see it in person, it's really, uh, there's nothing like seeing the real thing. Um, and so I'll go ahead and end the poll here. Thank you for participating in that. And we'll get started. Okay, so this is just a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, first, the significance of the cat. What's the big deal? What's all the hubbub? Why is it so important? Um, we'll just do a little background to give you context uh, around the rest of the presentation to follow. Uh, we'll talk about the history of the cat since its excavation in 1896. Uh, the transformation in power it's undergone. We'll compare what it meant at the time of its carving to what it means now, which is obviously completely different and reveals a real fascinating trajectory in its power. Um, witness to history, we'll talk about how the Key Marco artifacts are unique and that they've been part of a museum collection for more than a century. And so as such, they've seen a lot of change during that time, especially in terms of how museums operate, how they interpret the stuff that they have, and how they're displayed. And so we're gonna look at all the examples I could find uh, with the cat uh, of that over the past 125 years. And we'll also talk about common misconception. Now, there was this notion that it had been in a drawer for the better part of 100 years, uh, which is something that many people were concerned about before we were able to get the cat on loan. So we'll look at whether or not that's actually the case. Um, and we'll talk about how the Marco Island Historical Museum prepared to accept the loan because um, we'll, we'll have to outline all of the things that we had to address in preparing for these high profile, extremely fragile, and some might say high maintenance objects. Because all told, uh, between the Historical Society and Collier County Museums, we spent nearly a million dollars invested into the museum in order to make these loans happen. And so how do we justify the cost and was it worth it? Well, spoiler alert, we obviously think it was, but I'll go into details exactly as to why that is. Now, I've had a, a rather fortuitous route to my current position. I feel very fortunate to have been able to work here for the past eight years. Um, I started out as a volunteer at the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville in 2007, uh, where I later got to do an inventory and move of the Key Marco collections at that museum, all the while the Marco Island Historical Museum was being built uh, further south. And then as an intern at the Smithsonian in 2012, I once again found myself face to face with the key Marco materials there, uh, all before accepting a job here on Marco Island, which then would see me working directly and indirectly toward a loan of the cat for the better part of the last decade. So in a lot of ways, working with these materials has felt sort of meant to be, and I'm just privileged uh, and honored to be able to work with them. Now, as curator for the Historical Society, I work out of the Marco Island Historical Museum. Uh, it really began as a dream led by the MIHS to have a museum on the island. By 2008, the Historical Society had raised enough of its four and a half million dollar goal to begin groundbreaking on this 15,000 square foot facility uh, that became the museum, which is now co-managed by the Historical Society in Collier County. It opened full-time in 2011 and was designed specifically with an eventual return of the cat in mind, which is pretty bold thinking. Uh, the designers and architects even included a secure central display vault as the building's crowning architectural feature. And you can see there some of our permanent exhibits uh, at the museum in the photos on this slide. 
So as for the Key Marco site, well, in 1896, Frank Hamilton Cushing directed what was one of the most important excavations in the history of North American archaeology right here on Marco Island. In fact, the site was just up the road from the museum, less than three miles away. You can see on the map there, we're the little red star, that's the museum. Uh, and the site was known then as Key Marco. It was located on William D. Collier's property in what is now Old Marco Village uh, and was once a separate island or key. And sometime after its abandonment, a naturally occurring tidal mangrove swamp connected it to the north end of Marco Island. Now, the primary focus of Cushing's excavation was in a triangular area of muck in the southwestern portion of the site, uh, which he dubbed the Court of the Pile Dwellers. And the crew's discoveries were, as Cushing described, literally startling. And despite many archaeologists' best efforts, have not since been duplicated. And you can see uh, the triangular area of muck in the top right corner is the grid system uh, that overlays uh, the muck pit. And then in the bottom right, there's actually a picture of the muck pit before it was excavated. Now, Frank Cushing was a well-known anthropologist in the late 1800s. He was often described as a genius by his peers. Uh, the Smithsonian hired him at the age of 19 as a curator in its National Museum. And he's probably most well-known for his ethnographic fieldwork with the Zuni during which he became one of the first practitioners of participant observation, which is the method of learning about another culture by living and taking part in it. And so Cushing had more experience as an ethnographer than an archeologist, but his excavation techniques at Key Marco were innovative for the time. He used a grid system, which you just saw, 81 10 by 10 foot squares, which was actually not common practice in 1896. And although lacking detail by today's standards, his grid system provided limited context to certain artifacts and features, including the cat, which was found in Unit 15. Uh, Cushing was also the first anthropology to really notice the dynamic relationship between culture and environment in Florida and still is being studied today. So as I said, the uh, quarter of the pile, pile dwellers was the name that Cushing bestowed upon the muck pit at Marco. And it was there that they uncovered more than a thousand artifacts, including painted wooden masts, carved animal figureheads, netting, cordage, atlatls, shark tooth sabers, and a huge assortment of utilitarian wooden objects and shell tools, all of which were centuries old and improbably well preserved. And the result is just a spectacular assemblage of Native American artifacts that to this day offer us unparalleled insight into Southwest Florida's indigenous people. And these artifacts are exceptionally rare because many are made from wood, plant fiber, and natural pigments. And these sort of perishable materials just usually decay much faster than stone, ceramic shell, and bone, the stuff that archaeologists find more commonly in Southwest Florida sites. So these unusual conditions at the site preserved the ordinarily fragile materials for centuries. Uh, and most of the artifacts actually were made of wood, making it one of the comp most complete known representations of pre-Columbian uh, Native American material culture in Florida. And you can see some examples in the photos there um, on the bottom left, actually, those are wooden bowls. And uh, on the top right are shell tools with the original handles still attached to them. And then the uh, other two photos show the working conditions at the site, which were, uh, to put it uh, bluntly, mi miserable. And so when Cushing's team broke the seal of Key Marco's muck, some of the objects disintegrated almost immediately upon contact with the air and light. And Cushing estimated that roughly a quarter of all the artifacts were destroyed during the excavation and less than half retained their original form for more than a few days. And so many of the items were virtually indistinguishable from the surrounding muck, turning to mush just as soon as excavators uncovered them. Now, thankfully, Cushing had enlisted the help of a talented young artist named Wells Sawyer. Not only did Sawyer photograph many of the artifacts soon after they were unearthed, but he also painted vivid watercolors of the most noteworthy, uh, depicting them in their original colorized states, because of course, color photography didn't exist at the time. And so Sawyer's image is uh, now has housed at the Smithsonian Institution's Na National Anthropological Archives and the Penn Museum are our only record of what these artifacts look like when they were first excavated. Many are now damaged beyond recognition. And so we come to the Key Marco cat. 
At just six inches in height, it is probably the most well-known of all the Key Marco artifacts, if not the most well-known artifact from the state of Florida. Uh, its notoriety is likely due to a number of factors, including its remarkable artistry, its completeness, its familiarity, and its preservation to this day. It's in much better shape even than the other Key Marco materials. And the cat is comprised of an unidentified but probably native dense tropical hardwood. Uh, Cushing actually speculated that it had been saturated with some kind of varnish or, quote, frequently anointed with the fat of slain animals or victims. But museum condition reports actually indicate it may have also been impregnated with wax in a previously undocumented treatment, which I talk about more in my book. Uh, I believe that Cushing probably dipped the cat in a glycerin bath uh, without documenting it. And uh, there's various correspondence to back that up. But uh, little is actually known about the cat's creator, their motivation, or the item's broader significance. The car carvings widely assumed to be a product of shell and shark tooth tool work and is commonly described as anthropomorphic, uh, representing a half human, half panther deity, perhaps depicted in a state of ritual transformation. And the artist likely modeled the figure in part after the native Florida panther. Uh, others have suggested the figure might represent a more literal depiction of a costume performer, and you can see some examples there in the illustrations by Merrill Clark. From the ethno-historic record comes the most commonly cited purpose, though, for the cat and these other artifacts uh, from Spanish missionary father Juan Riguel in his recollections of the Calusa capital in 1567 describes, quote, a temple of idols there in which were some very ugly masks, which some Indians donned, delegated by it. And they went out into the village with them and the wretches performed their worship and adored them with the women singing certain canticles. Obviously this language is prejudiced, but the cat may have been akin to one of the idols that Regal describes, making it an item of possible religious or spiritual importance. Uh, in use, it may have been handheld, mounted to another object, or even functioned as a piece of shrine furniture. And Cushing's recovery of at least 14 well-preserved wooden face masks that Key Marco, like those described by Regal, kind of bolster this theory. And so the Key Marco cat is commonly attributed to the Calusa culture of Southwest Florida, which exerted influence over all of South Florida by the early 16th century, a time during which the peninsula and its native inhabitants were first encountering invading Europeans. And the Key Marco artifacts are generally considered pre-contact due to a lack of European goods found at the site. And uh, the Calusa heartland actually emanates outward from its capital at Mound Key, which is about 30 miles north of Key Marco in what is known anthropologically as the Calusa Hatchie culture region. Now Key Marco actually lies within the northern boundary of the Glades culture region, which is actually south of Caloosahatchee region, uh, but it's commonly associated with the Calusa due to its close geographic proximity and a relative lack of comparable organic materials recovered from the Caloosahatchee sites further north. So while the technology and the traditions observed at Key Marco are assumed widespread throughout Southwest Florida, uh, some ceramic analysis suggests the Key Marco artifacts may actually be distinctly Glades and depending on how old they are, which is a mystery for a number of reasons, which I also get into in my book, uh, means that they are not necessarily Calusa, at least as we think of them, um, as there was likely more diversity throughout the state, especially the further back you go in time. Uh, but they're often presented to the public as definitively representative of the Calusa, just because they're so rare, the iconography is so stunning, um, and they're the closest thing um, found nearby Calusa sites that uh, shows the complexity of their culture. So let's fast forward to March 5th, 1896, 125 years ago to this day. That was the day the Key Marco cat was found. It was found by Cushing himself. And it actually came at the first, uh, the perfect time for Cushing and Sawyer, both of whom were struggling with anxiety and depression during what was becoming sort of a sputtering expedition. And their luck really turned on a dime as is apparent in their fawning descriptions of the object. Cushing, who in his report called March 5th, quote, a happy day, also had this to say about the Key Marco cat. 
Nothing thus far found in America so vividly calls to mind the best art of the ancient Egyptians or Assyrians, as does this little statuette of the lion god, in which it was evidently intended to represent a man-like being in the guise of a panther. Although it is barely six inches in height, its dignity of pose may be fairly termed heroic, and its conventional lines are to the last degree masterly. And while Sawyer had very similar uh, things to say about the cat, this is from his journal on the day that the key Marco cat was found. The workmanship is so exquisite that the best Swiss carver of today could scarcely give it a better finish. And the design was so dignified and the convention so subservient that the best Egyptian work was suggested. The little figure is scarcely eight inches high, yet has the dignity of a colossus. Uh, it's actually six inches tall, but he was probably just getting a little excited. Now, you might not think it, but this was actually one of the most dangerous times in the Key Margot Cat's life. 70 days would pass between his discovery on March 5th and its arrival at the museum safely. For Cushing, the logistical realities of shipping the artifacts were starting to set in. He writes from the field, the whole difficulty is in the preparation of the specimens for shipment. This is a serious task. Merely to dry them sufficiently for packing requires days for they have lain in the brine soaked peat and marl for centuries. And if dried in the open air of even a room, rapidly warp and check. I therefore have to pack them in dry sand for a time, size them, place them under clothes on shelves and thus proceed very slowly and cautiously. And this drawing by Merrill Clark that you see here shows members of Cushing's crew sorting and packing artifacts at Key Marco getting ready to head back up north. And between the end of April 1896 and May 10th, they packed and had ready for shipment 11 barrels and 59 boxes of artifacts, most of which were sent to the museum in Philadelphia due to a lack of space at the Smithsonian at the time. The artifacts were packed very carefully, some in dry sand, as Cushing mentioned, and which is depicted here in the bottom right. And in all, more than a thousand objects made their way from Marco to Philadelphia. Now the artifacts were shipped first by boat to Tarpon Springs, a trip that actually took days and at one point saw the schooner swept off its anchor and out to sea, prompting a dramatic rescue of all of the artifacts. Once they were safely in Tarpon Springs, the majority of them were loaded onto a train for eventual delivery to Philadelphia. Now notice I say majority because that majority actually did not include the cat. Cushing decided it was too important to be left in the hands of others. So along with some of the other noteworthy specimens, he personally couriered the cat in box number 68, which you can see the original label for there on the right, from Florida to Washington, DC, via train, horse-drawn carriage, and foot. And this marked the first of many separations of the key Marco materials. Um, and the cat would later be delivered to Philadelphia by Cushing sometime between 1896 and 1897. And as you can imagine, unpacking and cataloging artifacts is quite the ordeal in museums, curators and collections managers are no stranger to this. We get boxes of stuff dropped off all the time. But imagine this, given the fragile state of everything, the unprecedented nature of the finds and the sheer amount of it, that's a lot of work. So here are some images of the original catalogs of objects, including the entry for the Key Marco Cat on the left there, written in pencil uh, from the University of Pennsylvania archives. And Cushing actually intended to personally do all of this work, including publishing reports, sorting, cataloging, labeling, even returning for more excavations. But for years after returning to Philadelphia, he was beset by illness, financial issues, and controversy. Some, someone actually accused him of faking some of the artifacts, including a painting of a human figure inside a clamshell, which coincidentally is on exhibit right now at the Marco Island Historical Museum. So what happened? Well, Cushing died prematurely at age 42 in April 1900, and he before he could really finish much of that work. And so what you see here is some of the correspondence in the wake of his death. Now, since the expedition was co-sponsored by the Penn Museum and the Smithsonian, they had originally agreed to an equal division of artifacts, which Cushing did actually make some progress on before his death. Uh, preliminarily cataloging them with two sets of numbers. The trouble with that though is each artifact is unique. So you can imagine the difficulty and the arguments that followed Cushing's death when these two institutions were trying to divide up the collection for good. And one particular object, even amongst the hundreds of other spectacular items, caught the eye of the two museum's curators. And 
I'll let you figure out which object that was. It was the cat. And the two institutions were close to an agreement in 1901 with Penn arguably getting the better end of the deal uh, with pretty much all of the sensational animal figureheads and human face masks, the prized objects of the lot going to Penn, including the cat, which is what Cushing intended. Now, Secretary Samuel P. Langley at the Smithsonian, who was completely unaffiliated with the dig, noticed this, and at the last minute added the key Marco cat by hand to a list of objects to stay with the Smithsonian. Now, Penn obviously noticed this last minute change. And so the chairman of the archeological department at Pennsylvania, Robert Brock, uh, politely asked the Smithsonian to reconsider and include the cat as quote, a personal favor. Then the Smithsonian politely declined, leaving Brock with what he called personal disappointment, but forever impacting the artifacts history. And so the formal transfer of materials was not made until 1908. So eight years after his death and 12 years after their recovery. And in the years since the artifacts have actually been divided up further with portions of the collection going to the High Foundation in New York, which formed the basis of the collection of the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian. So you've got key Marco items in two different Smithsonian museum collections, as well as the Florida Museum of Natural History. Uh, where I said earlier I was able to work on them as a grad student, and then the uh, University of Pennsylvania Museum as well. And as an aside, there are also objects at the British Museum. The initial finds made in 1895 by a British lieutenant colonel uh, that actually drew Cushing to Florida. And I had the good fortune to see these objects in 2013, and one of them, a large wooden bowl, is actually on exhibit in the same museum as the Rosetta Stone and the famous bust of Nefertiti as a representative object of the Southeast, uh, Southeastern North America, which is really cool if you're a fan of Florida history or Marco Island history. So Frank Cushing's discoveries at Key Marco made national headlines at the time. This article was published in the journal. This is a New York newspaper owned by William Randolph Hearst. Uh, on Sunday, June 21st, 1896, about a month after Cushing returned from Key Marco. And it shows the national interest generated by Cushing's find, uh, but the nature of the materials was so unprecedented that their very existence fostered wild speculation about the people responsible for them. And at the time, as unthinkable as it may seem today, the ancestors of Native Americans were not thought capable of producing such monumental shell or earthworks and artistically sophisticated materials, not just by the public, but by some anthropologists. Now today we know they were left by the Glades or Calusa people, accomplished human beings in their own uh, right with their own traditions, spiritual beliefs and customs, but they were certainly not lost or strange as this headline implies. But this is just an example of how long ago the Key Marco artifacts were found. I mean, this is the common interpretation of the day in the context in which the artifacts first re-entered the world after hundreds of years. Uh, and so before we go any further, this brings me to a second poll question, which I'm excited to ask. And that is, how long do you think from this point in 1896, the Key Marco cat would be on display in a museum? And so I'm gonna bring up the second poll here. And if you're still with us, go ahead and, and cast your vote for how long do you think the cat has been on exhibit since 1896? And this will help us answer that question about whether or not it's been in a drawer for a hundred years, not to give you any hints, but. Okay, we've got 40 out of 55 votes. We're kind of split here. We've got 16, 17 votes for seven years, 11 votes for 29 years, 12 votes for 46 years, and six votes for 69 years. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and end. Oh, we got a couple more votes here. All right, after one minute, I'm gonna end the polling. And you can see the results, the most votes is for seven years, the fewest votes is for 69 years, and uh, we've kind of got it evenly split between the four. Well, the correct answer is actually 69 years is how long the cat has been on exhibit, 
which is really surprising. It was surprising to me uh, to find that out. And so I'm going to show you just how uh, how long it's been on exhibit and all of the different exhibits it's been part of. And here is the earliest known exhibit photo of the Key Marco artifacts, which comes from the former United States National Museum, which is now the National Museum of Natural History. Um, and if you've been to see the Hope Diamond, you've been in this building. And back then it was common practice for museums, even the best ones to display their objects in what we call cabinets of curiosity, where as many artifacts are possible as crammed into a case with little or no interpretation and presented more as curios or oddities than material evidence of the past. And so it's reasonable for us to assume these exhibitions didn't change very often. This photo actually dates to March, 1956. And it's probable based on other correspondence uh, that I found in the archives that these Key Marco artifacts were on display here from the very beginning about 1913 until about 1962 when the exhibit underwent renovations. And if you look closely, you can see what I think is the Key Marco cat with its familiar profile on display in that case on the top image there uh, circled in red. And so it's kind of frightening to think about, especially with all that natural light you see pouring in, which can really damage fragile materials. But it's possible these objects were on exhibit here for as many as 45 to 50 years in just this single exhibit. Now we know the exhibits were modernized in 1962, the Hall of North American Archaeology exhibit. Uh, the Key Marco cat was featured in the wood carvers of Southern Florida case alongside other artifacts from Key Marco, Bell Glade, and the Caloosahatchee River in Florida, all of which are attributed to the Calusa. So the major difference here is that there's some interpretation in the attribution of the materials to a cultural group. And remarkably, the Key Marco cat sat on display in this exhibit case for another 21 years until at least March 1984, when the museum was building its museum support center in Suitland, Maryland, where many of its collections uh, materials are housed today. Since 1985, the Key Marco Cat has been incorporated into seven different exhibits at 11 locations around the country. The first exhibit, uh, the Ancient Art of the American Woodland, Woodland Indians, uh, began at the National Gallery of Art. Uh, in 1985, it drew 107,000 people and then traveled on to Detroit, the Institute of Arts, and the Houston Museum of Fine Arts uh, through 1986. And the exhibit was in keeping with changing museum practices at the time in regard to Native American material culture, where it was presented from an art historical perspective. And so the cat, which you can see again circled there, was exhibited in a wall-mounted case with three other Native Floridian artifacts. All of them were the, from the Panhandle area, more than 400 miles away, and products of entirely different cultures and times. Now, the next exhibition in which the cat appears is called Circa 1492, and it's one of the most ambitious museum exhibitions ever orchestrated. And it was developed by the Smithsonian to commemorate Christopher Columbus's 500th anniversary of his arrival in the, Amer in the Americas. It was one of many being planned for 1992, some of which were protested by Native Americans and others. And uh, the major art exhibit was intended as a survey of the world's visual culture around 1492. It was one of the first exhibits to look at history globally uh, through a specific window in time and included objects loaned by Queen Elizabeth, works by da Vinci, Michelangelo, other European Renaissance artists, and the cat was the only object requested from the National Museum of Natural History, making it really selected as a representative work, not only of Florida, but of all of North, South, and Central America. And this exhibit was only open for three months from 91 to 92 and drew 568,000 people. So three years after appearing in one of the most ambitious and complex art exhibitions ever produced in the United States, the cat took a far more central role in a simpler and more locally fo focused exhibition here uh, in Collier County at the Collier County Museum in Naples. And this ex exhibit commemorated the 100th anniversary of the Cushing Expedition. And its first ever return to Florida also marked the first of two visits to the object's native Collier County over a period of less than five years. And it was displayed from December to May of 96 and uh, 37,000 visitors saw the exhibit. 
and it traveled an estimated 922 miles each way for the loan, just 11 miles north of uh, the site from which it was found. Now, the His Marco Island Historical Society brought the cat even closer to its point of origin in 1999 when it orchestrated a second loan, uh, this time to Marco Island, back for the first time in more than 100 years for a limited millennium exhibition at the Citizens Community Bank, just a mile from its archaeological context. Uh, and this exhibit drew an estimated 18,000 visitors. It was displayed in a repurposed exhibit case, which was bolted to the floor. Uh, and ultimately, this exhibit proved successful as a marketing tactic above all else because uh, the successful return of the cat for a second time really started to give momentum to this movement on the island to build a local history museum. In 2004, the cat again joined a traveling art exhibition titled Hero, Hawk, and Open Hand. Uh, it was organized by the Art Institute of Chicago and displayed there. Uh, followed by stops at the St. Louis Art Museum, the National Museum of Natural History. And it was one of 25 objects loaned from the uh, National Museum and the only one from Florida. And it was uh, thematically much the same as the 1985 exhibit, but again, it was in keeping with evolving museum practices, uh, there was a subtle difference in that uh, it was the first exhibit in which Native American perspectives were at the core of the interpretation of the King Marco cat. And in September 2010, the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts got their hands on the cat. They contacted the Smithsonian regarding an exhibit they were developing titled Shape Shifting. And this exhibit marked the first time that thought or credit was given to the individual Native American artists who created the cat. In fact, in the object catalog, the first piece of information you see is an attribution to a Southeastern artist. And it was the first exhibit to acknowledge uncertainty over the item's age and cultural affiliation, and also the first to incorporate native belief systems into the specific interpretation of this object. Uh, in their catalog, they offer a, a native explanation for the carving's inspiration. Quote, Panthers, indigenous to what is now Florida, would likely have inspired native artists to create their likeness. Additionally, native people of Southeastern North America among others, uh, have in their oral histories the concept of a world order kept in balance by underwater panthers who rule the watery lower world and thunderbirds who rule the upper world. And these human animal beings are continually at war, not only to maintain the balance between the worlds, but also between the elements of fire and water. And the cat was displayed at this museum from January to April of 2012. You can see it again in the pictures there uh, in the red circles. And finally, we come to our exhibit, which first opened in November of 2014, but was revamped after four years of visitor feedback in 2018. And what's different about our exhibit, which is not as philosophically advanced as advanced as the last ones, but certainly was informed by them, is the emphasis on making it accessible and relatable to our visitors. The major mo uh, focus of museum exhibits today, especially history and science museums, in addition to making them educational is to make them entertaining, interactive, and whenever possible participatory, making visitors active participants rather than passive recipients of history. You know, basically giving them something to do, whether it's playing a game like piecing together our Calusa uh, pottery puzzle, coloring a Calusa mask in our craft corner, or navigating the actual grid system used by Cushing on a touchscreen interactive. Uh, and it also tried to present new ways and thinking about the same old objects in order to make a more personal connection for our visitors. So for example, we have a block of wood that weighs the exact same amount as the Key Marco cat that people can pick up and handle and get an idea for what it would feel like to hold that object in your hands. Uh, and this exhibit's also unique in that it incorporates hundreds of other objects from Marco Island from the same site that are held in the MIHS collections as compared to some of the earlier exhibits which you saw had the cat on display with objects far from Marco Island. So, uh, and just an as an example of how far we've come since that early curio case, the Smithsonian even created a 3D scan of the cat, which is now free to download online for anyone with a 3D printer, which would probably blow Frank Cushing's mind, who was, uh, you know, hard at work making uh, molds and casts 125 years ago. Um, so as you've seen, you know, the cat through its participation in exhibits for more than 100 years is really a living 
demonstration of changing practices in anthropology and museum interpretation, uh, all the while staying itself, never changing, but the fields and the disciplines evolving around it. It'll be really interesting to see how it's interpreted in the future as the fields evolve. And, uh, you know, getting artifacts on loan as fragile and important as the Key Marco Cat is, is not simply a matter of just asking and receiving. We had to make enormous investments into the museum to ensure a safe, secure, and high quality environment for both the artifacts and our visitors. Uh, and in 2018, we made major enhancements to the building, including the addition of a backup generator, which you can see being lowered in by a crane there in the top picture, strict climate and light level controls, security systems, archivally safe artifact cases, updated interpretation and interactive exhibit components. So all told, this cost us you know, nearly a million dollars. And it makes you wonder, well, is it really all worth it just for a few small wooden artifacts? And well, to us, the answer is a resounding yes. Here's a look at the impact the loans have had and are projected to have over the last you know, two and a half year period. For our little museum, it's been tremendous. As you can see, we've smashed our annual visitation record in 2019 by more than 15,000 people. Uh, of course, this past year has been derailed by COVID like everything else, but uh, it also helped us raise the profile of the museum improve its credibility, increase awareness of Marco Island's Native American history and culture, and had a major e economic impact on tourism in Collier County, an impact that actually uh, was greater financially than the investment that we made in the museum. And now plus with all the investments to the infrastructure of the museum, we're actually now well suited to care for our existing collections and request additional loans in the future at a much lower upfront cost. So it really brought uh, the museum up uh, towards best standards and practices all around. And it was a great thing for, for the museum. As for the Key Marco cat, the charismatic object status has really risen to that of a pop culture icon. It appeared in numerous publications and exhibitions, which I just went through, uh, and was even the subject of a 1989 US postage stamp. And so as a symbol of regional history and culture, this iconography and the cat in particular are really ubiquitous in museums throughout Florida. I've seen them in exhibits in Tallahassee, the Florida Keys from West Coast to East Coast, really all over the place. And on Marco Island that extends even further. You see it in local advertising, jewelry, street signs and more. And it's, it's really become a source of uh, identity and pride for a lot of modern Marco Island residents. Uh, and so in summary, you know, the Key Marco Cat really offers a fascinating case study of the power that a single museum object can hold and how that power can change or transform over time. You know, a small wooden carving, which was likely created centuries ago by a single artist and, and probably was communally admired for its spiritual connotations above all else, now is an iconic symbol of Florida's pre-Columbian Native American people having traveled almost 12,000 miles since it was excavated and is capable of moving millions of dollars in its use as an educational and promotional tool. Uh, it's produced jobs and even contributed to people's careers like mine. So uh, in a sense, you know, we worship the cat in a whole new and different way that is likely far different than was originally intended, uh, which to me is just really interesting to think about. So what's next for the cat? Well, to be honest, we don't really know. We're going to be returning it to its home in 2026, where it obviously is a hot commodity. Um, and I expect at some point it'll be exhibited again, perhaps after a well-deserved cat nap. And in the meantime, uh, my role as consulting scholar, I'm researching other artifacts in the Key Marco collections. We've got a magazine article coming out next month in Expedition Magazine. And of course, uh, uh, we mentioned the book earlier uh, on the Key Marco Cat specifically, which will be coming out in September of this year. Um, but it just really shows the exciting thing about museum collections is that there's always more to learn from them, especially as new ideas and technologies emerge and research continues to build off what others have done in the past. And so that's why it's so important that we continue to preserve these fragile artifacts, provide them the proper care uh, so that they can be continue to be enjoyed and learn from by future generations. And the Key Marco artifacts are just a great example of that. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the cat, including some of what you've heard today, be sure to check out my book, 
which comes out in September, is available now for pre-order on the University Press of Florida website, as well as I think Amazon and other places where books are sold. Uh, and uh, that's the end of my presentation. I want to thank you all so much for joining me today. If you're uh, interested in learning more about the Marco Island Historical Society and Museum, please check out our website or find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or visit us in person. We're open Tuesday through Saturday from nine to four and admission is free. So thank you all so much again for your attention today. And with that, we'll open up to any questions that you may have. Austin, maybe we can tell our listeners that um, down at the bottom of the toolbar for controlling Zoom, there's a QA and a uh, button that they can push and that's where they can type their questions. I'll also be keeping an eye on chat. So we have one up to, there they come. So there you are. Ah, okay, we've got a couple of questions coming in. Uh, will the cat ever have a permanent home? Well, the permanent home for the cat is uh, technically the Smithsonian Institution. So uh, when it's not here on exhibit, it's actually at the Museum Support Center in Suitland, Maryland, where it has a very cushy uh, box and is very well cared for in a climate controlled room. And uh, as far as I know, that will be the technically be the permanent home for uh, foreseeable future for the cat. We've also got a question here. Uh, what led Cushing to launch the expedition to Marco Island? Uh, well, actually, I, I mentioned those objects in the British Museum. Um, they were found in 1895 by a British Lieutenant Colonel who was just vacationing in the area. And he brought them uh, on his way back to uh, London. He stopped at the Penn Museum to meet with an acquaintance there who happened to not be present, but Cushing was present because he was visiting his personal physician uh, who was also uh, worked at the museum there. And so the two of them met with this Lieutenant Colonel Durnford and uh, saw the objects, knew that they were right away, they were of, of very important discoveries and that they were you know, Native American, pre-Columbian Native American objects. And so quickly organized a reconnaissance mission uh, later that year in 1895, Cushing actually came down twice, first in 1895 to check the site out, verify uh, what he thought he saw with these objects from Durnford, uh, and then organized a larger scale expedition at the end of 1895 and into 1896. Um, let's see, we had learned that many artifacts stayed in their original barrels for many years. Can you comment on that? Um, I'm not sure about that, actually. I, the research I found, uh, I couldn't find anything that said how long the artifacts stayed in their barrels once they arrived at the museum. I'm sure it took them quite some time to unpack everything and get it organized, but I don't have any idea exactly how long uh, that took. Uh, we've got a question here. Great talk. How many objects? Thank you. How many objects in total did Cushing find and how many have survived in displayable condition? Do any still retain their colors? Um, well, we found he found more than a thousand artifacts, probably closer to 2000, but of course, many of them disintegrated and weren't even uh, transported back to the museum, unfortunately. And then in the century plus since, a lot of them unfortunately have uh, warped and, and shrunken and shriveled and, and actually disintegrated. Um, it just in their trays. Uh, so some of them do still retain their colors. The, the painted um, uh, animal figureheads, for example, there's an alligator figurehead that's on exhibit right now. You can, you have to look closely at it, but you can see, see traces of the original pigment, which is just really uh, remarkable. But of course they've faded over the years. Uh, what is the wood carved from? Uh, from Noberto, hey Noberto. Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, a lot of people have speculated that it's buttonwood, but we don't actually know that for sure. And like like a lot of answers, we don't know. 
Um, there were two studies done on the Key Marco collections uh, where they actually uh, examined artifacts uh, under a microscope to look at the cellular structure. Uh, buttonwood was one of the types of wood recognized, um, but it wasn't necessarily that recognized for the Key Marco cat. So in my book, I go into the um, uh, 22, I believe it is, different species of Florida that the Key Marco cat could be carved from. Hopefully, maybe one day we'll know the answer, but that would probably require destructive analysis and uh, the likelihood of cutting a piece out of the car Key Marco cat to answer that question is probably pretty low. Um, do you think that the, this is from Craig Woodward, do you think that the wax found on the cat may have been applied by Cushing as part of his project to make molds of the cat and other objects? Yes, that's a good question. He actually, he, it's kind of uh, uh, not well documented, but he had these artifacts with him and traveling around with him, not only to from Washington to Philadelphia, but also to Maine, where he, in correspondence, talks about uh, concocting these preservative bath solutions to try to help save the Key Marco artifacts. And I think at some point he probably perfected or found a very good solution, uh, at which point he very likely dipped the Key Marco cat in a glycerin type bath. And um, that's probably in part why it's so well preserved today. And, and yeah, he may have done that in part to uh, stabilize them enough to make molds of the cat because there are molds and castings of the cat at, uh, in the basement at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. Uh, have the Marco artifacts ever been displayed together in one exhibit? Uh, several of them have, not all of them. Of course, there's you know a thousand and a lot of them are not in a state uh, to be exhibited. But uh, we have, for example, uh, right now four, four objects from the University of Pennsylvania an uh, alligator figurehead um, and uh, several other figureheads on display alongside the Key Marco cat. And um, they were actually displayed, I think, in that circa 1492 exhibit together as well. And, um, and we have objects from the Florida Museum of Natural History. So we've done a small reuniting of, of objects, but um, not all of them have ever been displayed together in one exhibit. Um, where is the muck pit? My grandchildren are uh, sure to want to know where it's located on Modern Marco. Well, unfortunately, if you're looking for the muck pit, it is uh, long gone. That that area of Marco Island has been um, dredged and filled and developed. And so uh, the general area of, of where Cushing probably made his finds is at the end of uh, Vernon Place in the cul-de-sac there. Um, but there's probably you know not much to see, uh, unfortunately. If Cushing's dig would occur today, would modern techniques have preserved the artifacts in a better state? Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, what they were doing at the time was sort of unprecedented. Um, and uh, now um, the artifacts actually would be kept in, in water and um, transported to the museum. And then eventually um, they have treatment procedures in which they could stabilize and, and um, uh, preserve these objects in much better shape. So they probably wouldn't have lost as many um, as they did, unfortunately, in 1896. Uh, general locale in Old Marco. Yep, as I said, at the end of uh, Vernon Place was kind of where uh, where these objects were found. There's a marker across the street from Merrick's in Old Marco, but that's kind of in the wrong location. Um, but the whole area of Old Marco really was an archaeological site in the the muck pit was just one small part of that larger site. Uh, was Father Regal trying to establish a mission in Marco? Um, no, that actually, he was trying to establish that on the capital in Mound Key, which is about 30 miles north from here. Um, there's a great book by John Han where you can find uh, translated, uh, his translated accounts. It's called Missions to the Calusa. And uh, I think, did I get all the questions there? You seeing any other questions, Pat? Looks like one maybe just popped up. Oh, yes. Is there a book that holds the artwork drawn by Wellsore as well as his photographs? Yes, there's a book. It's out of print now 
called the, I think it's called the Material Culture of Key Marco, Florida by Marion Gilliland. And she's got uh, dozens of Well Sawyer's um, photographs and watercolors uh, throughout that book. It was published in 1975, I believe. So you can still find copies here and there on, you know, uh, eBay, Amazon, and it's a great reference. Uh, shows all the different types of artifacts that were recovered from the site. And one more. Um, yeah, I don't see that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it says Craig Woodward. Thanks for your great presentation today. You're very welcome, Craig. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the book coming out as well. And someone says it's available at Calusa Heritage Trail on Pineland. I would highly recommend if you get the chance to visit Pineland. They have a beautiful, um, uh, the Calusa Heritage Trail is just beautiful. You can walk around a, an actual Calusa site uh, that's you know undisturbed and they are doing groundbreaking archeological work there all the time. And, um, and please visit the Randall Research Center. It's part of the University of Florida and a lot of you know this research that uh, I'm not an archaeologist, but um, based this work that I've been studying is based a lot on what they're doing at at Pineland, which is really just amazing. Austin, I see one more. That I don't think we answered. Can you talk more about the dueling spirits you mentioned? Also, oh, I'm Granada, sorry, I Nicaragua. That. I saw huge stone carvings with animal heads and kneeling human po posture. Yeah. So. The dueling spirits, um, it's part of a uh, uh, Native American uh, spiritual belief that these um, underwater panthers or piazzas as they're called um, would have ruled uh, the underworld. And so, you know, as an anthropomorphic uh, half feline, half human um, figure uh, it, that probably had religious or spiritual uh, importance uh, it may have been an item uh, like a piece, uh, a shamanistic item where uh, a shaman uh, would communicate with the spiritual world, um, perhaps using this object uh, as part of uh, their ritual, or the cat itself could be a depiction of that um, uh, ritual transformation from a human to a panther or an underwater panther or piazza. Uh, been a spiritual uh, figure in uh, their religion. I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm not familiar with the the uh, Granada uh, stone carvings, um, but there are certainly, uh, you know, you mentioned the animal heads and kneeling human posture. There are uh, several other artifacts from actually just from Florida uh, carved from wood found at other sites in the same posture. And so there's some question as to whether or not those were um, part of a, a larger uh, uh, religion in South Florida. Um, oh, we got another question here. Could you repeat the book on Wells M. Sawyer's paintings? Yes, it's by Marion S. Gilliland, and it's called The Material Culture of Key Marco, Florida. And it's out of print, but it was, I believe it was printed in 1975. All right. Well, thank you so very much, Austin. This was just a fabulous, fabulous presentation. Um, you know, you think you you know so much about this this treasure, and um, you find that there's a whole, as you say, nine more lives that we can can explore. So, so thank you for doing that with us. I, I just want to thank everyone who did join in, and um, please watch our website and look for our flyers if you're on our distribution or social media because we have a number of other uh, Zoom-in talks coming, uh, at least three more. And the last one in April is going to be very special. We will have a presentation by Dr. Meg Kassenbaum of the University of Pennsylvania. And she will be talking more about um, all of these precious treasures that we hold in the public trust. So we look forward to seeing you again in our Zoom in and Austin, again, it was fabulous. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone so much. It was, it was a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for all the great questions, really enjoyed it.